So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Aaron Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very generous uh, introduction, and thank you all uh, for coming. So I'm an environmental toxicologist. Uh, I study the fate and effects of chemicals in the environment. And so what that means in a, in a broader sense is that if you invite me to a dinner party at your house, I'm a super downer. Uh, I probably know about things that are in the food we're eating, the water and wine we're drinking, and probably things coming out of that little air freshener that you plugged into the wall about an hour before I got there and is now wafting volatile compounds through the house. Um, on the other hand, um, my laboratory, environmental toxicology in general, plays a really important role in serving the public trust. And I want to illustrate that. This is a, a result from a Google News search I did yesterday. And as you look through these headlines, uh, what you're going to notice is sort of a theme to some of the language. And you're going to see the word safe or safety, some version of that, popping up a lot in this. And I want you to think for a minute about what that term means, what safe means. And that's a question that I ask the students who take my toxicology courses on the first day. The ones that are here can verify that. Uh, and invariably, the students come back to, with some kind of definition that centers around safe is that I can eat this, I can drink that, I can do this activity, and nothing bad will happen to me. And I want you to think about that for a minute and, and whether or not that's actually true. Is it really true that something is safe is without the risk of harm? And, and the answer to that is no. I wouldn't ask the question if it was, if it was yes. And so, what it really means is that there is a probability or odds that something bad will happen are so low that we've chosen to accept that risk, right? So we'll still carry out that activity. We've decided that the odds that something as bad is going to happen is so low that we're going to do it. Great example of that is airline travel, right? The odds that something that you're going to be involved in an accident, in an aviation accident, are really, really low. But lots of people are afraid to fly, but most of us choose to accept that risk. So when your great aunt calls and says, I'm not going to fly uh, because that thing is just a death trap, you can tell her that it is a death trap. It's just a very low probability death trap. And so as I go through the talk today, what I want to try to convince you or convey to you is that the type of work we do is trying to determine what the probability that something negative is going to happen or what the odds are that something negative is going to happen and help inform the public, help protect environmental health, and help protect ecological health. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to start uh, with some acknowledgments. Uh, the work has been done with a large number of collaborators, both here in the States and abroad. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the folks that are involved with the Recover Project, the folks that were involved with our NRDA uh, work that I'll talk about later. And a number of those people, uh, Dr. Venables, Crosley, Berger, and Mager Lund, and Verbeck are here uh, at UNT. I also want to thank our administrative and support staff, the folks, Shelby and the team in the area office, the folks in the, in the department, the college, and over in the research office here, Carla and Mike's teams. Um, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today was done as litigation support, and so there are confidentiality agreements, uh, judicial holds, uh, lots of different things that have to get processed. And this work would not have happened without uh, their contributions. And last, but certainly not least, in fact, most of all, uh, I need to thank the undergraduate students, the graduate students, and the postdocs in my lab uh, who go out and stand at that bench top, get on a boat and get seasick, um, and go out, stand in cold streams, and do the sampling, process the samples, and generate the data uh, that I'm going to talk about and take credit for today. So in my laboratory, uh, we have a few different areas of research. Uh, we work on methylmercury in my lab, looking at methylmercury in fish and seafood. Uh, we're interested in how uh, mercury affects the dopaminergic system and contributes uh, to neurodegenerative disease. Uh, I have a group uh, that works on what we call emerging contaminants. So these are contaminants that are sort of quote unquote new in the environment. And uh, my student Brianne works on flame retardants, for example, in, uh, in seals. We do work on nano, uh, nanomaterials and nanoparticles. But what I'm going to focus on today uh, is our work on oil spills. And in fact, uh, we've done work or contributed to work on about four or five different spills. But today, I'm going to focus on the Gulf of Mexico and specifically uh, the Deepwater Horizon. But one thing I want you to take away from this is that oil spills happen more frequently than you think. Um, this is a figure showing oil spills or, or the pipeline network in the United States. 
uh, from the years 1990 to 2011. So when I talk about oil spills in the United States, most of you think Exxon Valdez and you think Deepwater Horizon. This shows you this pipeline spills that occurred in the United States roughly between those two major marine spills. And you can see there are lots of them. These circles that you can see are all at least a million gallons, and the big ones are four and a half million. And you can see here on the Gulf Coast, we have several that are in that four, four and a half million gallon uh, range. You just don't know, or you just don't hear that much about them. So Deepwater Horizon. Uh, the Deepwater Horizon was an offshore drilling rig, very similar uh, to this one down on the uh, Gulf Coast of Texas. It was located uh, roughly 40 miles off the coast of Louisiana, uh, drilling in about 5,000 feet of water. Um, due to a number of malfunctions, uh, natural gas and oil spewed up a pipeline, spread out over the surface of the ship and eventually ignited, causing an explosion. And you've all seen video footage like this uh, from the Coast Guard uh, uh, with the, the emergency uh, response. One thing that it's important to remember is there were, I'm gonna talk about ecology, but a lot of people were hurt, including 11 people who lost their lives. Of course, when Deepwater Horizon happened, there was a massive emergency response and a large number of activities trying to cap that well. Uh, but as Dr. Gao mentioned, the well continued uh, to, uh, to put out oil uh, until it was, it was officially sealed in September of that year. Now, while the oil is coming out of the oil, uh, the, the, the broken wellhead, uh, oil is coming up through the water column, spreading across the surface and forming a slick that expands down the Gulf Coast, across the Gulf states. It was visible from space. There was lots, it's a little hard to see here, lots of imagery. And there are lots of people out responding to this and trying to clean that oil up using boom and skimming activities as well as spraying of aerial dispersants. So dispersant is basically industrial soap, right? And they're applying that to the surface well as well as the wellhead and trying to break that oil up to make it more available for microbial degradation. So for microbes to come in and get rid of the oil before it reaches the shore. Unfortunately, there was a significant amount of oil that reached the shore, uh, particularly in Louisiana, and a massive cleanup effort there uh, went on as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind with Deepwater Horizon is that it's a, it's a bit of an unusual spill. Uh, Deepwater Horizon occurred at almost a mile down. Most oil spills occur much closer to the surface. If you think about a tanker, uh, a tanker leak, a pipeline leak, something like that, an accidental spill, where oil just spreads over the surface of the water. However, in Deepwater Horizon's case, we have oil coming from up through the water column and fouling ecosystems all through sort of a three-dimensional uh, through three-dimensional space as that oil is pushed inshore. Now, in that oil are a set of compounds called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and they're com composed of these fused benzene rings. And when the oil first comes out of the rig, it's actually sort of pipettable, I call it. It's liquid, you can, you can do things with it. But it's exposed to solar radiation, wind, wave energy, and it changes. That oil, the, the chemical composition and the physical properties change. And it becomes these different compounds and more of a peanut buttery type structure. And this is the stuff that we had shipped in here to North Texas and that we worked with and prepared testing for uh, in, our, uh, in our laboratory. Now, at the same time, keep in mind this is happening in the spring, you have lots of offshore fish, shellfish, and aquatic species spawning in the Gulf of Mexico. Many of those have positively buoyant eggs and larvae. And so those eggs and larvae are spawned, they move into the surface waters, and what do they encounter? But rather these slicks of oil. Now in my laboratory, one of the things that we're particularly interested in is a phenomenon called photo-induced or photo-enhanced toxicity. And that is, is uh, a, a phenomenon in which the compounds in oil are able to absorb UV radiation. And you can think of this as in they become sort of supercharged. They become much more toxic than they would be without UV. And those supercharged compounds break down lipids and cause tissue damage in aquatic organisms and eventually lead, uh, lead to uh, mortality. You can think of PAHs, of this compounds and oils, sort of being like the anti-sunscreen, right? You put sunscreen on your body to block UV, to keep it from burning you. Crude oil actually enhances that burn and increases the toxicity. 
So we got involved uh, in the Deepwater Horizon case uh, in late 2010, early 2011, as part of what was called the Natural Resource Damage Assessment. And the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, the NRDA, you'll hear me call it NERDA as I go through the talk, uh, is a process by which we try to determine what the financial loss to the public is in terms of natural resources. So how much in dollar values uh, fish were lost, birds were lost, uh, beaches, uh, uh, fouled and, and so on. And so we were brought on board um, to do, in fact, this UV enhanced uh, testing. I'm not going to go through everything we did. Um, we worked with a lot of different species. These are uh, embryonic oysters. This is an early life stage blue crab. This is an embryonic mahi mahi. But I want to give you a flavor of some of the data that we produced. And so what you'll see in all of these graphs, the y-axis is some measure of toxicity. In these cases, it's survival. Uh, and along the x-axis, what you have is the concentration of oil. So as we go from left to right, we're increasing oil concentration. The white bars, so I'll point you to this top graph, the white bars are experiments in which we expose the animals to oil, in this case, mahi-mahi. And they're exposed to oil, but no UV. And you can see that, in fact, oil alone is toxic to mahi-mahi, coming out here around 18.6 micrograms per liter. However, these dark bars are where we've now added UV to that mix. So these animals are exposed to both oil and ultraviolet radiation. And you can see that the toxicity effect is amplified uh, by ultraviolet. And what we see is toxicity occurring around two to four micrograms per liter. So about a tenfold change in toxicity, which is pretty, pretty significant. We see the same sort of an effect in blue crabs, uh, in which, you, again, you see that oil is toxic to their larvae out around 200 micrograms per liter, but when we add UV, it drops down to somewhere around 10 micrograms per liter, okay? So we're seeing these fold differences uh, in toxicity. Now, we tested uh, red drum, mahi, uh, snapper, anchovy, sea trout, a couple different species of shrimp, a few different species of crabs. Uh, we did some work with snails, and the list kind of went on and on. Um, as we kept generating toxicity values, more and more people wanted us to work with their species of interest. Uh, and across life stages, we were working with larvae, embryos, uh, we worked with oyster gametes at one point, uh, and so forth. And what we saw pretty consistently uh, was this type of an effect, where you got toxicity with oil, but again, that effect is amplified by exposure to UV. So I told you that what we're trying to do is determine what is impact in the field and how can we look at this from this idea of safe or risk posed to the environment. So we've got these exposures where we've done a lot of work with oil we've in the laboratory, we've done exposures to UV in the laboratory, and now we want to go out and try to apply that to the Gulf of Mexico and determine what potential impact was. And so one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you start talking about light and light penetration in the Gulf of Mexico is water transparency in the Gulf is a very heterogeneous thing. This is a satellite image. It's a little hard to see, but down here is the slick from Deepwater Horizon. And if you move into blue water out here, UV may penetrate down tens of meters. Uh, we know from measurements we've taken uh, that we still have UV down at 30 meters, almost 100 feet of water, which is pretty amazing. But as you move into these nearshore areas, especially where you have inputs from big river systems, you can see here that the water is more green and off discolored. And so UV penetration in these systems is much, much lower. Uh, it's gone in, in, in under a half a meter uh, in many cases. So what that means is we can't take our laboratory data and just apply it to the Gulf of Mexico and call it done, right? We have to look at this uh, as, a, as, a, as a much more complex uh, type system. So how do you get at that? Uh, if you're me, you find your postdoc, so this is Kristen Bridges, and you put her on a small boat and you push her out to sea uh, with uh, a light meter. So we have some light meters in our labs, some sort of fancy ones uh, that measure different wavelengths of UV. We're able to deploy those off the side of the vessel, and we can put these instruments into free fall uh, in the water column. And they read, uh, they take light measurements five times a second, and we can start getting profiles, we can start estimating profiles of how deep UV goes in some of these different environments. So, and not just how deep it goes, also what is the intensity at some of these different depths. We went back to monitoring buoys in the Gulf and weather stations during, and were able to mine data from the time of the spill, when the spill was still active, and we were able to determine what the average surface UV dose was uh, for a given day in the Gulf of Mexico during the Deepwater Horizon spill. 
by applying our model that we built and just published, we're able to make estimates on what UV is like or was like at that time in some of these different habitats specifically and by depth. So we can now make estimates not just at the surface, but we're able to estimate what UV was at five meters, 10 meters, uh, and so forth. So we've now got laboratory data where we've done toxicity work and we know how toxic oil is to the organisms. We've used UV in those laboratory experiments. We've gone out in the field and measured UV. So now how do we translate that into an impact? So what you're seeing here in this figure, uh, the y-axis in this case is toxicity, and on the x-axis here we have UV. Each of these points is a separate experiment. So these are all dose response experiments. In this case, these were run with drum and speckled sea trout. This work was done uh, in Lake Jackson, Texas. And what you see is that UV, each of these was run under a different UV um, uh, condition. And what you see is that UV is a really good predictor of overall toxicity in these experiments. And so what that means is, if we were to take a look at a habitat that we've gone out in the field and measured, and let's say that a red drum is found in a habitat that gets about 500 units or so uh, of ultraviolet radiation, then we can expect that that animal is going to see toxicity, say, around eight micrograms. So if there's less than eight micrograms of oil in the water, this animal, the risk, the safety to this animal is, is fairly, uh, fairly robust. This animal is probably not in a lot of trouble. But if we take a red drum that's found in a habitat that has much more transparent water or that animal is found closer to the surface and is receiving a much higher dose around that 1,500 daily, then we know that that animal is more likely to be impacted even at concentrations down to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 micrograms per liter. So that UV dose makes a big difference, and where those animals found are found makes a big difference. But we're able to use that UV data and start to make estimates on toxicity and what we may see in the field. So what did we do? That, that's more or less, that's exactly what we did. Um, on this graph, what you see is depth on the y-axis and oil concentration on the x. Each of these green dots represents a water sample that was taken during Deepwater Horizon. So this is somebody out on a boat with a sampling device, pulling a sample in, and then these are all run uh, for, for oil concentration. What we can do is take our toxicity model, and we're able to overlay that toxicity model onto these, these collected samples, and we can start making estimates of what happened in the field. And so everything to the left of this toxicity line is probably safe. This is relatively low risk. Everything to the right of that line was much more likely to be impacted. And this is really important because if you take an animal that was exposed, was in a habitat that had about a microgram per liter of oil, but that animal stayed at a depth, say in this case around 10 meters, or stayed in a habitat where the UV matched that, that animal is probably not going to see any toxicity or, or the, the risk is relatively low. However, an animal that's exposed again to a microgram per liter of oil but is found up in surface waters above, say, less than uh, three meters in depth, that animal is much more likely to be impacted. So the oil concentration is not the only thing that go into these models. We're also using the light exposure uh, to, to, drive it as, or to drive the models as well. So, I've spent 10, 15 minutes talking about death and dying. I told you that a toxicologist is a downer to have a conversation with. I wanna switch gears a little bit, and I wanna talk about some of the more subtle effects that oil may have on aquatic organisms. Um, this is a figure that's, that's uh, referred to as the constellation of effects of oil. This was done by some colleagues of ours uh, at Apt Associates. And what this shows you is that Oil toxicity is not just an oiled fish or an oiled bird or an oiled dolphin washing up on a beach. In fact, exposure to oil may have caused DNA damage. It can cause oxidative stress. It may affect ion channel function, change gene expression, lots of other things. And what that suggests is that these are fish or organisms that may be exposed for a period, swim off somewhere, but then have some other type of effect occur to them. Things like immune dysfunction, cardiac disease, reproductive dysfunction, and so forth. And so we were fortunate recently to get involved uh, with the Recover Project, and some of you have seen uh, some of the, the materials we have for that. 
And the Recover Project uh, is a consortium uh, project that involves uh, about four different universities, uh, including uh, five faculty at UNT who are involved, folks at the University of Miami, University of Texas, and UC Riverside. Uh, Warren Bergeron, Dane Crosley, Ed Mager, Barney Venables, and I are all involved with this project here. And what Recover has allowed us to do, the, the goal of Recover is to look at some of these subtle, sublethal effects and what they may mean for some of these animals in sort of the long run. And so what we're able to do is get access to things like red drum and mahi-mahi at the coastal aquaculture facilities. This is a video. These are mahi-mahi eggs uh, from a captive population in Miami that we use. And so this allows us, by having these models, these sort of non-model species, and being able to take advantage of aquaculture techniques, we're able to sort of produce better, uh, uh, more environmentally relevant toxicology data. Now, how do we go about looking at these things? So one of the ways that we approach this is to look at gene expression, global gene expression. And this gives us a, uh, a hint at what may be going on long term in some of these animals. So we're not, we're exposing these animals, they're not dying, they survive the initial exposures, but what happens to them down the road? Now, there's a lot going on in this slide, and in fact, I don't know what some of this stuff is, but I will tell you that we group these, these are all, uh, these, in this case, these are microRNAs, but we've also done messenger RNA. And what we do is we take changes in these genes and we group them by pathways, disease pathways that they are associated with, right? And so if we see a set of genes that may be involved in cardiovascular disease, so there's a number of people at UNT that are doing cardiovascular work, uh, work that's involved in GI tract disease, uh, immune dysfunction, and so forth, we can start to get a handle on what these subtle effects might be. And in my laboratory, uh, we became particularly interested in eye disease. So, Vision is really important for a fish. If you're a small fish, you're trying to catch food, you're trying to evade a predator. If you're a big fish, you're competing with your conspecifics. So you'll see here in a second, be some squid at the water. He's got, oh, he doesn't have it. He was too slow, right? He maybe he didn't see it before his tank mate saw it. And so vision can play an important role in these fish and their ability to feed and their ability to avoid predators. And if you think about the eye of a fish, and some of the fish biologists will laugh at me when I say this, but the eye of a fish and the eye of a human aren't that different, okay? Uh, they both take in information, they transmit it to the brain where it's processed and we get uh, pictures, right? And so we're able to, to respond to stimuli and things in our environment. But we can't take a fish to an ophthalmologist. So how do we go about trying to determine how well a fish can see? I know everyone in this room at some point in their life has stared at the ceiling and watched the ceiling fan spin. Sometimes you may have wished the room around it would stop spinning. But if you focus on these fan blades, you can see them at low speeds moving. You can keep your eye on one blade. But as it speeds up, you lose that ability to track a single blade, right? They all sort of blur into one. And that's a, that's a phenomenon called flicker fusion, right? Your eye can no longer discern between one blade and another. Fish have that same response. We can put a fish in a chamber that has black and white stripes, and a fish will find a stripe and will follow it around and around. And as we speed that up, that tank or that cylinder, rotating cylinder up, the fish at some point cannot discern between stripes and they will stop moving. We can reverse the, the, the direction on it, the fish will pick it up again, start moving in the opposite direction. And we can use the speed at which the fish can no longer visualize in the chamber as an indicator of visual acuity. And so this, I hope no one has a seizure when they watch this. This is actually slowed way down. Um, here you can see this is a juvenile mahi-mahi, and he's following these stripes around. When we switch the direction on this thing, the fish flips over and goes back in the other, uh, in the other direction. So what happens when a fish is exposed to oil during development? So we expose fish as embryos. So these are not larvae, these are not adult fish. We expose them as embryos for a relatively short period of time to oil. We move them into clean water and we raise them up under clean conditions. So what happens is first we see that the eye itself doesn't quite develop correctly. This is a control eye moving in to oil exposed eyes, and the oil exposed eyes tend to be smaller. Some of the layers of the retina don't develop uh, quite as well as they do in the controls. And what we've seen in these animals 
What you're looking at here is a histological section of an eye. The green here is our tagged cells, and these are cells that underline and support the neuronal network in the eye. So this is supporting the nervous system and the cells that are transmitting information back to the brain. The red cells, which is a little hard to see, these are dying cells. And so what you see in these animals with increasing oil exposure is we're seeing a loss of that neuronal network, the ability to transmit information from the eye to the brain and an increase in cell death. And all of that culminates in a fish that can't see. So these are our fish uh, that are almost two weeks old, so 12 days, 13 days, and 14 days uh, post-hatch. The light-colored bars here are control animals. And you can see even at 12, 13, and 14 days, vision is still developing, vision is still improving, their ability to respond, and so forth. But if you look at our oiled animals, at day 12, we have almost no response. Day 13, they're far behind. Day 14, they're getting a little bit better, um, but still are behind the controls in terms of their ability, uh, in terms of their ability to see. And we've seen this same effect in mahi, we've seen it in redfish, we've seen it in sheep's head minnows, and we've seen it in, in uh, zebrafish. So this seems to be uh, across uh, a number of taxa. So, when I show you the next slide, um, if you didn't believe me that fish, uh, that, that vision is important, I've got the extended feeding video of the one I showed you earlier going on, uh, and I'm gonna go through my conclusions really quick. So from this talk, I hope that you come away understanding that, that fish and other early life stage organisms are more sensitive to oil exposure than previously known. So many of the effects that I'm talking about here are in the one to 10 microgram per liter range, which is very, very low concentrations of oil. If I showed you a flask with one to 10 micrograms uh, per liter, you wouldn't be able to tell me that there was anything in it. It's clear water, um, doesn't look particularly foul. Oil toxicity is much more than just an oil slick and a dead fish. So just because things aren't washing up on the beach anymore doesn't mean that populations of fish aren't potentially impacted. And then what I really want you to think about, and, and Dr. Gao uh, mentioned this in his talk, is why are we still looking at the Gulf of Mexico? Well, we're looking at it in order to better understand what happened there to, to inform the next spill, right? There will be another one. Uh, we can say there won't be, but there will be one. And they have a major spill happens about every 10 years. So in fact, we're due uh, for one pretty soon. And so by understanding which organisms are sensitive, which habitats are more sensitive, we can better respond to that situation. That informs regulators, that informs, informs responders about habitats uh, that they may need to protect. Resources are finite, where do you deploy, uh, and so forth. And it also helps us understand what the long-term consequences may be in those systems. Once the dead fish stop rolling up on shore uh, from an oil slick, uh, what, what else may be happening out in the Gulf? And so with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, my funding agencies uh, for the NRDA work, uh, in particular APT Associates, NOAA, and the state of Louisiana. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative uh, funds the Recover Project. I didn't talk about it today, but we're doing work with the Australians uh, uh, on the west coast there with some, some oil things. And then I also want to acknowledge ARI uh, for providing support to us the past uh, few years. Uh, and with that, uh, I would be happy to try to answer uh, any questions.